welcome to the latest episode of Branding the Experience, where we discuss ways how we can create environment where employees actually want to come to work and customers want to keep coming back. I am Ken Bader, your host for Branding the Experience, and I got a great guest, one that we're going to have a lot of fun with. Uh, met her at Podcast Movement Evolutions, and we just laughed our asses off, so we had to get her <laughs> on the show. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She is a comic, so we know she's funny, at least hopefully for the sake of her <laughs> career, she's funny. Uh, but her name is Christine Blackburn. Uh, she has been a flight attendant. You know, that comedy will probably come in really handy if you ever want to go back to that. A <laughs> uh, Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, so is my wife. We'll talk about that. A published author. She's also a cancer survivor. Uh, and despite her own story-worthy life, she continues finding delight in the stories and lives of others. As a producer, writer, and skilled interviewer, Christine and her production company, Story Worthy, uh, excuse me, Story Worthy Media have produced over 550 episodes of her weekly storytelling podcast. Uh, Screwed Up Stories is her other podcast, and we could all probably identify with that, especially now, <laughs> uh, which is co hosted by comedian Rachel O'Brien. Uh, and brought to you from Westwood One Podcast. I can go on and on, but let's talk to Christine. Christine, welcome to the show. Hi, Ken. It's so nice to be here. Thanks. <laughs> it's great to have you. Yeah, you know, we're going to talk about branding through storytelling. Uh, but because mm -hmm. A, I'm an only child, and B, this is, is my damn show, I'm going to ask whatever I want first. So I want to go to uh, the Peace Corps thing because my wife was in the Peace Corps. I didn't know her then, but she likes to tell yeah. stories of very, very large bugs that also have wings. Yeah, oh, yeah. Is that your experience? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I do have that exact experience, actually. Yeah, flying cockroaches. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's so funny. But wait a second. So that's so interesting because when we met Ken, it's like we we immediately, you know, bonded. And I think part of it is because I'm from Pittsburgh, you're from Chicago. But you're an only child? Yeah. Yeah. That's I get so what surprising. I want. That's yeah. Okay. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Because I'm... I'm I'm the youngest of six. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, and being the youngest of six is a great impetus to uh, to hustle because yeah. you don't get anything you want. <laughs> well, see, but the good thing about that, I hear, I wouldn't know personally since I'm an only child, but I've heard from people that are the youngest is that they can get away with anything. Like, for instance, you know, right. by... My wife's youngest brother, you know, by the time they, she's, she's the middle of three, by the time they got to the last one, you know, they're like, you know, do whatever you want. You know, I'm <laughs> so done with this parenting thing. The rules thing. were gone. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. The rules were gone. I always have a, um, a, a quick antidote. Is that how you say it? Antidote? How do you say that? Antidote, yeah. Some, something like that. Or antidote. Uh, when I... When, Something like that. When my oldest sister was 18, she was the lead in the senior class play, Our Town. She had the lead. And my father would not allow her to go to the cast party. Yeah, because oh. it was, you know, too late. It was dark, whatever. When I was 17, younger, uh, younger than 18, <laughs> if you know the numbers. Yeah. Uh, anyway, when I was 17, I crossed the country with Bobby Pfeiffer in an Econoline van with a mattress in the back. <laughs> Uh, and I was gone like two months. So that's that's the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I, I'm not a parent either, so I wouldn't know. But I hear at some point you're just like, you're, you're good. You're good. So we're, our, we're, already, we're already in awesome storytelling mode. By the way, for, for the <laughs> audience, uh, you know, when I first met, met Christine, we were in line to get into a party <laughs> at Podcast Movement Evolution, Evolutions, and she gave me a kiss. I did not. You did too. It Wait, was a Hershey's what? kiss. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it chocolate. I'm not talk I'm not talking about on the cheek, you know, no tongue, nothing like that. I'm talking about an actual chocolate Hershey's kiss. So and I, yes. <laughs> that's where I remember you from first and foremost. That's how I bribe people to come to my session. I put a little, you know, chocolate kiss on a little card and I say, you know, It'd be sweet if you came. I mean, yes. it's just whatever you have to do, you do. But see, to, to segue into something that, you know, actually our audience might actually want to hear about, yeah, you know, is that's great branding because I remembered that. 
Um, and I deliberately, yeah. I deliberately went to your session, which was very, very awesome, by the way. Because I'm like, uh-huh. hey, you know, this is this is different. You know, this is somebody that I want to not just hear from, but learn from. And I think that's something that our audience can really learn from is, is finding, you know, that that right hook, you know, and not right hook, but correct hook to to get people to want to engage with you. You know, so do you agree with that or am I just, you know, talking out of whatever? <laughs> No, I mean, you know, look, it's so obvious. People, everybody wants candy. Everybody needs to pick me up at these conferences. You know, they get lo- they get long, they get boring. You're in these hallways and, uh, you know, everybody needs to pick me up. So if you put candy <laughs> around on the tables, they're going to eat it. And if there's a card attached to that candy, whatever that card says, they're going to read it. So, I mean, it just makes sense. I mean, that's a tiny little thing, you know, that's, that's a tiny little thing, but there's, as you know, there's so many different little uh, things you can do for marketing. You don't have to be able to get t-shirts or sweatshirts or baseball hats. You can do something that small, you know, a tiny piece of candy on a, on a piece of cardboard that my daughter helped me make, you know? So it's like, uh, it's nothing yet. It's everything because you know what? Nobody else had candy at that conference and there was 3000 people there. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, you know, it's something. Yeah. Yeah. And then unfortunately today in this post pandemic world, handed out candy or uh, even tchotchkes, you know, might not happen anymore. In fact, I was talking to one of my clients and he was saying, you know, when we go back to events, I don't know if I'm going to be able to even hand out a stress ball because we can't exchange stuff oh no i think stress balls will do really well (laughs) and i'm also going to start a whole brand story worthy cannabis so there's going to be that and then i'm going to get face masks with story worthy on them so you know nice there's all sorts of things we can do (laughs) (laughs) well tell us let's segue into story worthy uh because it's a great show it's been around for almost 600 episodes from what i understand no no uh, it, you know what i'm on i'm on episode 620, 620. you were reading an old bio well yeah. then, then i encourage you as a brand expert to go back to your linkedin and change the darn thing <laughs> well you're on I episode, will. I will. you're on episode 620 that's awesome uh tell us yes. how story worthy even got started um, you know, it was, uh, it'll be 10 years ago, actually, now. It was uh, April 2010 that I came up with the idea. The first episode aired in July of 2010. And uh, basically, it was two things came together. One was I was uh, going to The Moth a lot. The Moth is a storytelling show. It's a live show. They started it in New York, and now they're in all the cities. And basically, people get up to true five-minute stories. So that was going on, and I was going to a lot of those here in Los Angeles. And at the same time, Adam Carolla had just left his uh, radio show here in Los Angeles, or they had, you know, changed the radio format, and Adam had gone over to podcasting. So Adam, I was a big fan of his, and of course a big fan of Howard Stern as well. Uh, so Howard had gone to Sirius, and Adam was doing his own thing, and that spoke to me like, wait a second, then that's tangible. And Mark Marin was doing his, his thing as well. So it was really like Adam and Mark and Howard, those guys uh, gave like, me the oh, idea. Larry that, Curley, yeah. Yeah, I could do, <laughs> I can do this. And so, um, you know, and so I just came up with the idea and uh, I started the first show to air it on July 10th. And this July, it'll be 10 full years. Nice. So uh, it's exciting and it's, it's a lot of fun. I've interviewed people from Larry King. He was just on for the third time, actually. Uh, to Sugar Ray Leonard, to uh, all sorts of amazing talents. Recently, I got to speak with Barry Sonnenberg, uh, director, and uh, Sonnenfeld, excuse me. Anyway, it's just, uh, it's been a great ride, and it's, you know, it's it changes all the time, right? So my music changed. I had a co-host at one point. The graphics, well, actually, the logo never changed. It was always story-worthy, which yeah. you see here to my to my left. Um but 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 still, I'm always making new things and and extending out from story worthy my podcast. So I have a game show called Story Smash, and now I just started Story Worthy Hour of Power, and that premiered last week. It'll be on this Sunday, every Sunday at six o'clock p.m. Pacific time on Zoom. 
more details at storyworthypodcast.com. And uh, so it's like, it's moving art, a podcast. It's at least what I'm doing. It's moving art. It's always changing. It's always, you know, it's always, uh, it's, it's never the same. So it's exciting. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. It's great points there. Yeah. I think that, you know, one of the things that I picked up on and I, I tell this to my clients all the time because I think that, you know, over the last 20 years, we got, you know, a wild hair up our ass to embrace change. And mm-hmm. yeah, I say, you know what? Some things absolutely positively need to change. Uh, like now, mm-hmm. you know, we need to do things more online. We need to embrace technology and so forth. Uh, and then I stress that, you know, some things just don't need to change. You know, our core values in our company doesn't necessarily need to change just because times have. Yeah. Um, even, you know, from a branding standpoint of visually, I love that you said that the, that the logo has not changed. Um, no, you, not at well, all. It, it's, it's an identifier with your, with your audience or with your customers or with your members. You know, unless there is a true need to change, you know, why would you want to alter that? I often joke. Yeah. Uh, as a comedian, you'll you hopefully you'll laugh at this. If you don't, then I won't become a comedian because I obviously won't be funny. But <laughs> you know, there's one particular organization that a colleague and friend of mine joke around about. Yeah, you know, they uh, they grew a great business and they needed to evolve into something else about two three years ago. And the powers that be decided we needed to evolve, so we're going to change our logo. And we're sitting there going, well, why in the heck do you need to change your logo? That's not the problem. The problem is the way that you offer your service. You know, that's the issue that you need to look at. You know, no change in logo is going to yeah. change that. Now that we're in this pandemic and they are hitting some rough times, as unfortunately a number of businesses are, uh, I joke with my colleague, well, since they're hitting rough times, maybe they could just change their logo. Everything will be better. <laughs> <laughs> that's just not the way it works no that's funny there's an ex- uh, a, a great example here in my own neighborhood there is a uh like a mailbox service place they've been mm-hmm. in business for at least 15 years and the name of the business is box brothers so it's b-o-x-b-r-o-s because these two brothers got together and they started this little mailing center and i've always gone to box brothers because they're so good at what they do. It's a couple cents more than the post office, but I still, I like those guys. I like to support them. I like the business. They have three open now. And just this year, they changed the logo and now they're, they're called Goodman. And I went in and I said, what the hell's going on with the sign? Did you guys sell it or what? And they go, no, no, we just decided to change the logo. And I'm like, I have no idea now what you guys are. And I felt really bad because I think I ripped on him a little too hard and the guy's like looking down and he's like, we, we just changed that marquee. And I'm like, well, you guys messed up because Box Brothers was perfect. Your brothers, it's mailing and boxes and shipping. It was perfect. Now, Goodman tells me nothing. And not only that, I think that Box Brothers is gone. I think I'm not going to get that same service. I actually might not even stop now because I think you're different. So it was a poor move on their point. That being said, I still go to them. I love them. And I apologize every time I go in <laughs> that I was yelled at that guy. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I gave you such a hard time on a complete strategic choice that you made. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I... But you I, were wrong, so... <laughs> You were wrong, and I'm right, so I'm going to tell you about it again. That's, that's perfect for your brand, Christine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, it's, but it's a great example. You know, if, you, if you have a visual or a message that is resonating with your customer base, um, you, you don't want to change that. In fact, a lot of times when it comes to branding and marketing, even though you may be bored with it, you know, I'm glad that you're not bored with your logo or the name story worthy because it's beautiful. You know, so why yeah, would you, why would you change it? Even if you're bored with it, it's very possible that your audience, it may just be resonating with them right now because of the consistency yeah. and the repetition. So why would you want to change that? So going back to, to storytelling, 
Um, you, you have an amazing story. I only read a portion of it, uh, especially since apparently it's an old bio anyway. There's probably five more paragraphs you need to add. Um, yeah, so you have a unique story in and of it, in and of itself. How does you know, telling your unique story continue to build your brand, continue to build your podcast? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I decided uh, to do a storytelling podcast because, like I said, I had been listening, you know, going to the moth and stuff. But it was also because um, I do have a unique story, but everybody does. Everybody does. Even if it seems boring to you, it's still unique. And so uh, for me, that's how I knew I could set myself apart out here in Los Angeles, because initially, you know, I wanted to be an actress. I mean, I guess I am an actress. Nobody, nobody but... ever comes from Pittsburgh or Chicago to California to become an actress. <laughs> that, that never happens, but go ahead. Uh, well, what I'm saying really, though, is that there are, like, the, the competition out here for acting is just, like, extraordinary, right? Because you get people, the best people from every place in the whole world they're coming here like every homecoming queen from every state every country is coming right here to los angeles so the competition is wild so rather than trying to compete with those uh incredibly talented performers i decided you know what my own story is interesting enough uh, to sell. And not only my own story is interesting enough, everybody's story is interesting enough. So I decided that that is something I have over uh, other actresses who maybe are trained really well or whatever. I have my own story. So, uh, you know, that's why I decided story worthy. It's like ev everybody has that. And so I only ever, you know, have people telling true stories, of course. And I just find it obviously more interesting than fiction. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I covered true crime for Podcast Magazine, and yeah, mm -hmm. when, when, when I see a podcast that uh, covers um, fictitious, you know, obviously shows in the true crime, it's not even true crime, it's untrue crime, I usually gravitate away from those because mm -hmm. reality is actually so much scarier, uh, and in our case... Yeah, I mean, you know, look but, at the Tiger yeah. King. I mean, yeah. <laughs> how could you get more interesting than that? Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I think, you know, from a comedic standpoint, uh, reality is a lot funnier than anything you could ever make up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and look at our government. Yeah, it is what it is. So, yeah, I agree. So, yeah, well, I got to ask a very serious and important question based on what you just said. Were I'm you excited, a, okay. Were you a homecoming queen? No, I was on the homecoming court. No, they put me with the uh, foreign exchange student and I did not win. I see. So, <laughs> so you're blaming the foreign exchange student for, for your failure. No, basically what but it was kind of like, I, I, I always have had friends that were kind of like underdogs or like, I've always had like, like in school, I had nerdy friends or I just always was not the, on the popular side of things. I wasn't. And so I had a place, but it wasn't in that cheerleader mode. Got so. it. Got it. Well, going back to business and branding and, and you as a great businesswoman, um, you created a media company, Story Worthy Media. Um, and I'm seeing that. I don't know if it's a trend um, or something that's been around the last few years, but I'm intrigued by it. And we have you know, a number of uh, freelance consultants um, speakers, podcasters that do watch this show, um, you give me a little bit of the genesis of starting an actual media company, not just the idea of having one podcast, but making that content into a business in and of itself. Yeah, well, it's taxes, right? I mean, it's kind of like for tax purposes, you want to do a DBA, a doing business yeah. as. And so, you know, it's, I don't have a corporation. I just have a DBA, but it's enough for me to uh, be on my own. I don't employ anybody. Uh, I have people that help me out, but I don't, yeah. I don't, you know, I don't have a uh, Can you employ me? I'm looking for a job. Can I send you a resume? Yeah, you'd be a perfect intern. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I know, uh, I know how to get yeah, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. No, but I guess it's just, you know, it's like, look, 
whether you're, whether you're, if you're with a big company or you're all by yourself like me, I mean, you know, in life, you guys, whatever you say you are, you are. So yeah. I am at the owner of Storyworthy Media. You know why? Because I said so. And I, I pay the DBA fees and I yeah. do my taxes under such, such that, you know, that name. And I feel like you can't wait around for the phone to ring and somebody ask you to be a part of their company or you ask them, you know, somebody's going to just come along and pluck you out. I mean, it could happen, but I doubt it. And for me, it's just always been about hard work and creating it on my own. So I created Storyworthy Media 10 years ago, and I have my podcast, of course, under that. Also my game show, and now my new my new show, Storyworthy Hour of Power, on Zoom every Sunday night. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. No, I love from a branding standpoint, you know, I mean, the tax thing is, is cool in and of itself. Uh, but from a branding standpoint, you know, it kind of encapsulates uh, in a good way all of the great stuff that you're doing. Um, and, yes. right, and, and rightfully so, you know, it's, it's not, it, it shows to people, it's not just a show. You know, there's, there's a business for the right reasons behind all this. Um, so last question that I have for you, or one of the last questions is we didn't talk much about the game show. Tell us about the game show and the brand oh, that you created. There. I, <laughs> I have like the best game show. You guys, it is so damn funny. It's called story smash, the storytelling game show. You can go to story smash You'll see how the game is played. There's all sorts of details and uh, you can find it on social media at story smash. Basically contestants come up, they, it's comedians mainly. They spin a wheel, and whatever the wheel lands on, they tell a true one-minute story on that topic. So if it might land on vacation or mom or breakup or drunk tank, uh, whatever it lands on, they tell a one-minute story on the spot. They know a few of the categories up front, but most, for the most part, they don't know the categories. And then there's three judges uh, behind them who comment on the story. So it just is hilarious. I have five contestants, the expert judges. I always have Danny Zucker, who is an executive producer on Modern Family that just ended. And I've had on fabulous talent. Larry King did the show. Um, I have Wayne Fetterman. I had Felicia Michaels. Just a tremendous amount of uh, talent. And so it just is a funny, funny, funny situation. There's three rounds. The first story is one minute. The second story is two minutes and then two storytellers go into the third round for a true three minute story. Yeah. It's a full one hour show. It's perfect for prime time. You could even do it with kids. And uh, I've been doing it at the Hollywood improv for 34 shows in a row nice. until the virus hit. Yeah. 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 It's a blast. We play every month. It's just so much fun. So we hope to get back to it and we might even try to do uh, you know, an online version of it, a virtual version, but we, we've tried, it's a little bit tricky, but we're working yeah. it out. Yeah. That's, that's tough. I mean, telling a story is one thing, but to fit it in one, two or three minutes is a lot more difficult than people that haven't done it, that it could think. Yeah. It is, but you can tell a story in one minute. You really yeah. need a lot less time than you think. Yeah. Well, I, I like to hear myself talk. So telling a story in one minute just isn't going to happen. But uh, <laughs> you've you've already you've already said it a few times. But uh, last question, where can people find you? Where can they find Storyworthy? Where can they find the game show? Where can they find your new show? Uh, I believe it's Hour of Power. Where can they best find Christine and um, Storyworthy Media? christineblackburn.com how about that perfect <laughs> perfect that's yeah that's easy enough it's easy and very easy to remember yeah you know, christine thank you so much for for taking some time even in the pandemic in a busy schedule <laughs> uh, to have some fun with us today i really appreciate it thanks ken i appreciate you as well thank you <laughs> thank you christine and thanks to all of you in the audience who have watched this show and here's hoping as always that you're branding the experience at a very high level for all those you serve take care thank you for watching branding the experience i hope you enjoyed the show if you're looking for a speaker on branding the experience on workplace culture or on business strategy I have a number of different options for you, 
And my approach is always to entertain first, engage second, and educate third. It's a formula that leaves my audience not only laughing and enjoying, but also learning. So if you want a great speaker on branding, culture building, or strategy, I'd like to hear from you. Simply send me an email at kbator, B-A-T-O-R, at btcinc.net, or to learn more about the presentations that I've done that have been successful in the past, go to www.btcinc.net.